You can spare that for the end. Maybe you won't like the presentation. So thank you, first of all, for the invitation. Thank you, Irina, and the rest of the organizers for putting together uh, this conference. It's always a pleasure to be here. And thank you all who survived so far and who are still present in the room. Hopefully, uh, this won't be too boring. Uh, and I'll try to keep it brief, relatively brief, so that we have more time for discussion. I hope that all of you know famous Paul Gauguin's painting titled, Where Do We Come From? Where are we? Uh, what are we? Where are we going? And the title of that painting summarizes those, one could say, eternal questions that each one of us individually asks him or herself at some point in life. And of course, it summarizes also kind of broader quest of humanity, of the humankind as such. But what we are very often, or what we think we are, very often depends on how we conceptualize where we come from and where is that we are going. And these questions, questions about who we are as human beings is not an abstract question or is not primarily an abstract question that's relevant just for philosophical discussions. It also has very practical implications because the way we conceptualize who we are and also how we relate to non-human entities such as the world or let's say some supernatural entities such as God or gods, that pretty much defines also how we relate to the world, other human beings and also ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. One modern theologian said that this world is a fear of gods. I'm paraphrasing the rest, and we choose which one of these gods will be our god. But we are responsible for the choice we make, because how we live is pretty much determined by who is the god we chose, and each period of time has its own dominant god or gods, and we can choose from that selection. Modern time is no exception in this respect. We are surrounded in modern times by different gods, some of them more prominent, than others, and very many of those concepts that all of us are familiar with from our education, such as secularity, secular world, or being just human as it is, as some kind of immediately present entity, such as biological entity, or the concepts of objectivity and subjectivity and so forth, are no more but mythologizations something that actually is very misleading, if not straightforwardly uh, misconceived. Because secularity of the world, more often than not, means nothing else but secular religiosity, replacing some kind of traditional religious ideas with new ones, with uh, those that are secular religious. And many of those ideas rest on, to pick just one of those important intellectual constructions from the beginning of modernity, on, the, on deism and deistic vision of the world. And if you are not familiar with that in very simplistic terms, deism means uh, the existence of a god who created the world but then left the world to 
pretty much operate on its own. And many of those early modern thinkers were deists precisely in that sense that they conceived uh, the world as something that has its origin in divine uh, creation, but that in itself it operates based on some uh, laws, some principles, independently of that uh, divine interference, which actually makes the world and those principles knowable. But then, within such a world, the human being is also often conceived as either something that is reducible completely to that natural world, or even more as something that's a mechanism, which has a definite set of laws that govern human body. And then the human mind serves as an ideal tool which reflects the structure of the world and enables us to know the world and also the human being in what they are in their essence, whatever that may be. There we have also a distinctly modern attempt to reduce things in the world, the world as such, and also the human being and human society, to a set of abstract concepts, abstract concepts that correspond to abstract laws that govern our existence and the, the existence of the world around us. And out of that intention comes also the ideal of transparency and clarity that of course has brought so much uh, good to human societies in the modern times, but also is a source of many problematic things that become more evident only recently. We are also very often used to under, understanding of natural sciences as those that deal with uh, objective facts which is another mythologization, so that's not really science, it's scientism that talks about objectivity. Science has more objective reality, science has more authentic science, more modest goals. So we are used to this polarization between natural sciences and human sciences that supposedly deal with human spirit. But we also witness to a transition that's evident during modernity that those human sciences lacking very often more solid basis start mirroring natural sciences which sometimes leads to many tragic consequences. So we can notice that there is a dualism built into the very core of modernity that sometimes is expressed as necessity of the natural world which operates as a mechanism, as an automaton, and human attempt to grasp freedom or human capacity for freedom, whether it be freedom of knowledge or freedom in the socio-political realm. But that tension is really something that has never been successfully resolved in modernity, precisely because that freedom seems to lack more solidly grounded uh, antic foundations. If we think of the world as a mechanism, as functioning on some kind of uh, predetermined laws that are everlasting, then actually it is very difficult to conceive how a free being or any kind of freedom with some, uh, let's say, antic metaphysical significance can be derived from such a world. So the human being very often seems to be trapped in modernity between the necessity of the natural order and our 
more than human projections or sometimes less than human projections. We see there something that is not, of course, characteristic just of modernity, that we have hard times thinking of ourselves, either as individuals or just the humankind, as just human, as if being just human is never enough, that we constantly aspire to project ourselves into something else, either the rest of the created world or, as we'll see, in some other things like with, when it comes to, to modern technologies, or into the divine realm, into something that is supranatural. And out of this uh, being trapped between, on the one hand, the necessity of the world, and on the other hand, uh, the desire to project ourselves outside of the realm of the necessity and what is given to us, come many of the modern fantasies that all of us are familiar with, such as the fantasy of cyborg or creatures such as the creature of Dr. Frankenstein that very nicely link with uh, our contemporary movies that talk about all sorts of dystopian narratives and uh, the fantasy of zombies. You know, a zombie becomes a role model of a human being that actually is reduced to an autonom autonomously functioning mechanism. It moves around, it looks alive, but it actually lacks authentic life. It seems that those fantasies of what it means to be human, modern fantasies, very often function as self-fulfilling prophecies that we very often project certain ideas of what, what it means to be human, and then we are trying to catch up uh, with that projection or that image. And that, I think, goes also for all sorts of post-human or trans-human, transhumanism narratives that we very often take for granted that we are moving into one direction and we are more and more becoming similar to the projection, to the idea that we postulated, but then we mistake our projection for the real thing, for, let's say, necessity, that it needs to be that way, and we forget about the origins of the fantasy. These intellectual processes that are outlined briefly here, who is interested can read more in the books that Irina mentioned at the beginning, uh, went hand in hand, or still go hand in hand, with the development of another big thing that made an everlasting impact on how we live today and also throughout modernity, and that's modern capitalism. Because modern capitalism introduces also a superhuman entity which positioned the market as this new deity that operates on its own and then postulates and requires us to conform to its requirements. Human beings and the rest of the world become instrumental to this deity. And in modern capitalism, which makes it different from some argue, well, capitalism has always been there, not modern capitalism. Markets have always been there. But the distinction between pre-modern capitalism and modern capitalism is that the market is postulated as the role model for all kinds of social relationships and society as such. Everything is turned into an abstract value, into money. And something that is really inconceivable if you step back and try to think about it is what has become real, very operational. And that's the idea that everything can be reduced to an abstract 
value, and that means you can put a value tag expressed in money to everything in the world, including human beings. So nowadays, very often we talk about, you know, uh, how to replace certain organs, and the question becomes just how much does it cost? Whether we do that by using uh, products made in a lab or by using organs from other human beings. We also talk about the rest of the world, even the ideas that, you know, we should just put a price tag on, you know, everything, air and uh, water and everything else is there, there is in the world as a way of resolving problems such as ecological issues that were to a significant extent created by the very mechanism that now tries to resolve it by the means uh, it used to create the problem in the first place. Once everything becomes money, we witness to what we already know from very clearly explained from 19th century thinkers that a human being is being commodified and goes through the process of alienation. So much so that we are uh, very used to the concepts such as human capital nowadays, or human resources, or enhancements of our performances, and so on. And with the development of new technologies, we have a very uh, interesting, in many ways beneficial, but in other ways extremely dangerous symbiosis between algorithms and capitalism. Algorithms that are in service of capital and also capitalist power structures, which means that some of these early modern ideas that I mentioned at the beginning actually triumph nowadays in the dehumanized abstraction that we very often call being human within the capitalist system. Now, I wanted to give this uh, outline just as an invitation to discuss together the contrast that we find and or that I find very striking between these visions of the human being that are very much, I think, present in our contemporary culture, but in, in very often in a fragmented way so that they are not immediately visible, and the Christian understanding of the human being. And we have heard already uh, a lot about that uh, today and also yesterday. And I'll just mention, well, basically repeat some of the stuff that has already been said and mention maybe a couple of new things to see how much the vision of what it means to be human and also what it means to be human in this world can be different from these intellectual streams that I uh, talked about uh, earlier. How Christians understand the human being depends, of course, on how Christians understand God. And here, by understanding, I certainly don't mean this reduced, logical, fragmented, and completely transparent understanding that much of modernity is so in love with, but rather understanding as a way of relating. God, for Christians, is the creator. And what it means is not only that, it, that God created the world because deists, as I already mentioned, thought the same, but that he is, that is the pr primary meaning of, 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 of that, uh, the way it evolved in the Christian tradition, that God is antically free from what he creates in the sense that he is not compelled by anything to create. But more than anything else for Christians, all these other attributes such as you know, God is all-knowing or God is all-powerful 
These are not, I think, for Christians, essential properties of God. Essential property, if we can use that word uh, in relation to God, is for Christians that he's all loving. So being ontically free, being able to create without any necessity attached to that, and being all loving become those properties we can relate to. And so if we are images of God, of that God, then in some fundamental ways we also are capable of authentic creation. That means that we are also capable of being free in a metaphysically significant sense and also that we are at our best as human beings when we are capable of love, when we love. That also means that we preserve the mystery not only of God, but also of the human being. Because the way we understand God is if he is all loving, if he is love, and if the only way we can really relate to God is through our faith, which is a leap of freedom, requires a leap of freedom, and through love, that means that through a loving relationship, knowing the other person actually reveals that person, whether it divine or human, without exhausting it, without ever making it transparent. The mystery of God human revealed to us in Christ is the revelation to use the, the, the images from the Old Testament from behind the veil, behind the veil of the temple, seeing what is hidden in the Holy of Holies which of course symbolizes the eschaton. So the mystery of who we are will actually is being revealed to us through love, but will finally be revealed to us only in the future kingdom of God. That means also that being human here and now is more what we can be. We are more what we can be than who or what we are now. There is more of us to come than what is now or what is in the past. But that also means that contrary to many narratives we are so familiar from the Christian uh, history and history of theology, is that transgression transgressing all the boundaries is a fundamentally human property. We are humans because we are not identified with who we are or with any order or pre-existing things that surround us or that are part of us as, let's say, natural or biological beings. And it is fundamentally human property, especially when the transgression is made out of love, when, let's say, natural order is transgressed, is defied out of love for another human being or the world. This then also means that we as human beings are capable of existing not only, as one church father put it, I'm paraphrasing, not only without an end, but also without a beginning, which means to be like God, to exist like God, or be gods by or through grace. And in that sense, to just draw uh, a couple of conclusions or final, uh, final words, is that this future orientation this in creating ourselves or co-creating ourselves uh, with God in the future kingdom of God means that we are also, we become true anarchists, those without other 
end goal, beginning or principle, rather than to exist out of freedom and out of love. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope we have still some time to discuss some of the points. Um, well, thank you for good timing. And uh, I think uh, um, questions uh, will be coming. Kusimo said. I just want you to kind of uh, maybe go back to your title uh, about big data. Uh, so how would what you are uh, describing, you know, can be applied to this kind of revolutionary changes in, in technology? And uh, how would we th understand theologically well, what you mentioned about algorithms and uh, um, uh, artificial intellect, perhaps. Maybe you could just comment on that. Hmm. Well, well, they are related things, uh, but, but somewhat, of course, uh, also we can, we can separate it. So the, the point with, with algorithms was to say, of course, the story is much more complicated and a longer one, but to say that uh, there is a certain understanding of the world behind that logic, behind the technology, the way in, in its, let's say, social life. Uh, it, the idea goes back to certain behaviorist ideas, and they themselves uh, go back to some of these early modern ideas. Uh, they're, they're not interested in really anything except visible, measurable data, okay? Once you reduce the human being or the rest of the world to certain data that you can collect, it proves to be extremely efficient. You can do all sorts of things with that. But it's also a totally false epistemology. It's a totally ill-conceived way of, let's say, understanding the world. But it is a way. Uh, you actually collect a lot of data and then you start, of course, interfering with the world and uh, human beings, human behaviors. And this really, once you start doing that, it's not only that you, as we all know, we start doing things that we don't think about, like ordering all sorts of you know, uh, commodities uh, online or even behaving the way we start talking or the way we dress and so what we think are the priorities in life and so on and so forth, even our social uh, interactions, they become to a large extent uh, influenced by those algorithms that are actually structuring more and more our uh, relationships with the world, with other human beings through social networks and so on, all other types of online interactions. Uh, once that is then merged with uh, corporate logic with capitalism, it becomes, of course, uh, not only manipulative, but also profitable. So it becomes a way to turn human beings into commodities, so that uh, all the data that we generate serve actually in order to either sell us back something or to turn us into commodities to be sold uh, on the market to someone or something else. And of course, once you uh, put this together with political power, uh, the challenges actually that present themselves to human freedom and a kind of civilized uh, human life, which includes uh, all sorts of these concepts that we got used uh, throughout modernity, uh, freedom of thought and expression and so on, they actually become kind of endangered species. But the question then of artificial intelligence per se and what it means, I think, yeah, is a little bit more complicated to unpack. So, uh, any, uh, any comments on that? Any questions? Okay, yes. Tina. <laughs> I can always rely on Tina. <laughs> Thank you so much. On muidugi väga ohtlik praegune tendents. 
Palju tänu tõepoolest on ohtlik nagu usaldada see big data, mis loob ühenduse suhestab utoopilise reaalsusega. Kuid küsimused, kas on võimalik ka, et big data kannab mingisugust transcendental signifaie, et see võib tõlgendada ka midagi püha, nii kui üks ettekanna just rääkis, et püha kujutelm ja see oleks siis võibolla noetilise reaalsuse kujutelm, et kas te näete mingisugust niisugust võimalust, et puhastada kultuur utoopilisest tõlgendusest igasuguste Frankensteinide ja ulmeliste kosmose valutus teemadega ja sinna sisse panna midagi, mis siiski suhestab reaalsusega, mis on nagu tõeline tõde ja reaalsus. Ale teia. Well, yes, I do, but not in a direct, any direct sense. Just as we can, let's say, ask a question whether a hammer can be, uh, you know, used somehow for, you know, divine uh, or for deification of the world. Well, yeah, in an indirect way, if you use it uh, in order to make something that, you know, helps uh, other human beings and, you know, uh, saves them, improves uh, life and so on and so forth. So I don't think that, uh, you know, big data is per se something that uh, needs to be evil in every possible respect. Uh, it uh, can be used with, uh, let's say, a democratic control. Uh, it can be used for, you know, in a beneficial way. Uh, but unfortunately, the way it is normally used is not that way. It is to actually create uh, those zombies that, that I talked about. It is used mostly to actually isolate us in our own private individual worlds and to actually prevent much of those things that we associate with dignified human life and existence, such as freedom, as I said, such as love, such as compassion, such as protests against uh, oppressive and dominant ideological narratives. Uh, I mean, so much that most people actually don't even notice that they uh, live in extremely oppressive ideologies. Uh, you know, most people in many, you know, as far as we can tell, at least based on some polls, you know, will think, you know, they, they live in kind of freedom or, or democracy, you know, um, even if it's sometimes in a cynical way. But like we don't live in, in anything resembling a normal kind of free and uh, open society where people can freely interact. And one reason for that is that many people in most countries in the world, including the Western Hemisphere, actually can barely uh, make to live. You know, that's an oppressiveness to just, just forget for a moment of all other types of, you know, the lack of freedom of the press, which is, uh, which is extremely high. Uh, you know, the more and more narrowing down freedom of thought. Uh, actually, most people cannot, many people, and in some societies, most people cannot actually make a decent living based on their work. So that's a source of extreme oppression. And I think there are many ways in which that could be changed and indirectly then if we act out of compassion and love for other human beings and the world, uh, that is an indirect mediation or contributing to the transformation of the world. And I just mentioned human beings, nothing about the environment. So you can think about that, a lot of things that can be done in that respect as well. Right. Uh, so. Um, if there are any, if there are no questions, uh, we would thank Davar for his presentation. There oh, there is question. Sorry, sorry, I was. But, uh, that will be the last one. Et ma küsin selle eesti keeles, et mu inglis keele on hea. Et inimesed inimestel, kui tuli kirjasõna ja valitsija saatis külla kirjaga, oma korralduse vist valis inimeste põrse ehmatav see olla, et kuidas tuleb üks sõna kuskilt ja me peame sellegi käituma hakkama. Täna tuleb neid sõnumid igalt poolt ja nad on väga anonüümsed. Ja ehk me ei tea autoreid, me ei tea, kus nad pärit on, küll aga nad mõjutavad meid. Teised poolt on Jumal ka see, keda me ei saa näha. 
mis on minugi inimesel võimalus selles maailmas hakkama saada, nii et ma ei kaata jumalati ja nii see endane ka alles, kus saan on ühimsuse surve nii meeletu. Well, I think the same way in which that used to be the case uh, before. And a crucial thing, I think, is uh, uh, establishing relationships, free and loving relationships with other human beings. And that, I think, is a huge challenge nowadays because of all sorts of uh, things such as, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it's much more convenient or, you know, cheaper for companies or you have COVID crisis. It is much, uh, you know, easier to just work from home that in itself contributes uh, or adds to the social atomization that's already there. Uh, in some places in the world, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, worker uh, unions uh, have been uh, dismantled and even are not legal to establish. Uh, so uh, that contributes to social atomization and that does not only mean that there is a lesser opportunity for workers to get organized in order to defend their rights, for example, against exploitation. It also means that there is less opportunity to have an authentic interhuman uh, encounter and exchange. And add to that all sorts of other things that are kind of coming in or are kind of almost now instinctual uh, attempt to escape anything that potentially can be, uh, can take us out of our comfort zones. And that can be virtually anything nowadays, you know, a thought, a speech, a concept, uh, let alone, God forbid, another human being in a real encounter. So we try, we are almost trained very often to prevent uh, that from happening. And if you buy into that ideology, and if you think that's good and proper, you're limiting yourself the opportunities for an authentic human encounter. And if you can't see another human being, and if you come to recognize God in another human being, I'm afraid that's what Christianity and the gospel t uh, tell us, you know, we won't be able to see God either. Thank you so much.